Thanks for being with us today. You've probably heard of Alex Boyer. Last time he was here, we went live on Facebook. Throwing up for that. Yeah, there. we went and surprised a, a, a local lady who had cancer. That was amazing. Alex uh, had a stomach bug. Yeah. But you're, you're, you're well today? You're feeling yeah, well? I hope so. yeah, man. Tell I'm us, way better than before. <laughs> tell us what's been happening in the, since the last time we saw you. Oh, man, just uh, having more kids. Yeah. I guess that's the big one. I think I've had 10 more kids since I've been here. <laughs> In two years. Ten and years. we have one on the way, so. Congrats. Yeah, yeah. So that'll be seven. That'll Number be seven. seven, yeah, seven. Wow. And uh, yeah, I've been doing a lot of performing and just changing my, my direction a little bit. Actually a lot. Um, I, I, you know, for probably the last time I was with you, I was doing a lot of YouTube stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, what I wanted is that I wanted to go, I uh, use that YouTube as a, as a platform to do um, other things, meaning not just doing it for the sake of putting videos out on YouTube and being a YouTuber, you know? Um, my goal is to be like a, you know, a recording artist um, that happens to have a YouTube channel as opposed to the other way around. So, you know, my, I, I want to have songs on the charts, you know, on the world charts and stuff like that. And so it's almost like an arrow, because people are like, oh, I don't see as many of your videos anymore, this and that, or your videos don't get as viral as they used to, and stuff like that. It's because I worked every day on, you know, in mean? those things, it's a lot. So I just basically taking the same work ethic, but work, putting it in a different direction. So it's almost like an arrow where you have to, you know, to get the trajectory, you have to push it back, and then you let go. So I've just kind of stepped back, and working on So now I've got like, a, I'm with an agency, and they're like, the. The, I think like the second biggest agency in the world. Oh, wow. And they have like, we're talking like from Tim McGraw to Beyonce, oh, that they represent great. Kevin Hart, all that. Yeah. So to get, you know, onto that stuff, you, you got to work in a whole different way. So finally I got that. I've been working on that for like six years, trying to get on this agency. Um, and then, you know, um, I've got like a whole team around me now, and PR people who used to work for Sony Records or Columbia, who are helping to promote my stuff. And so we're just getting ready for a big, a big push, so, and it's taken a few years. So when you're here in two years from now, you'll have a whole entourage and security. Well, and I don't know about that. All I know is that two years from now, I want to sell out like you, the biggest concert, concert halls in this area. That's my goal. So for those people that aren't familiar with you, yeah. take me back. You were born and raised in London, right? Yeah, born and raised in London, England, and I was uh, pretty much raised by my mom, you know? Uh, my dad, he moved to Nigeria, well, he, uh, he moved back to Nigeria. We all lived in England, and that's why I was born and raised. And he moved back to Nigeria, I think, when I was about two or three, and I never saw him again because um, my mum and dad separated. So my mum pretty much raised me. When I was about 11 years old, my mum was going on vacation. So many, many times during when I was really young, my mum would take trips to Nigeria. Sometimes she'd go for maybe a year or two years or something like that. And uh, so she'd leave me in England, and I'd be, she'd put me like with foster parents, something like that. And so I, I went through the foster care system a couple of times, and uh, you know, a few times, and ran away from one or two of them. And then, you know, when I was 11, and she'd come back, and when I was 11, she said, you know, hey, I'm going away to, back to Nigeria, I'm gonna be there for three weeks. And so I was like, oh, yeah, you know, and uh, I didn't see her for eight years this time. And so that was, uh, that was really tough. There was just people, you know, she, she left me, um, at, she put me at this boarding school. And the boarding school, looking back, was probably the most amazing thing that happened to me. And it was like a boarding school that was like, you, you, you've seen Harry Potter, right? It was like Harry Potter with all the magic, but not with the magic and moving floorboards, but just everything else. Wow. The, yeah, the place looked like Downton Abbey. Really? Uh, insane. i got to get, if you type in Wolverston Hall, uh, Google it, Wolverston Hall, W-O-O-L-V-E-R-S-T-O-N-E, Wolverston Hall School in Ipswich. It's, it yeah. even has a fancy name. Yeah, it exactly, even, yeah. So did you have siblings? Uh, I have, so my mum... Uh, I have half sisters. I, I have two half sisters and a half brother okay. or step brother. I don't even know the difference now. Yeah. It's just you know different mom, different dad, right? Different, dad. different dads. Yeah. So um, yeah, so I um, I lived with them just for a little bit, and it, we were all really scattered. But it was pretty much just me and my mom. Um, when she moved to Nigeria, though, she moved with my son, my brother, who was considerably younger, so she couldn't leave him. So she went, uh, she went with him. So you moved into this boarding school for eight so years. So I'm in this boarding school for eight years. And uh, 
you know, I used to remember thinking, well, this is going to be temporary, you know. My mom's coming back. I used to look up in the sky and see a plane, and I'm like, oh, that's got to be my mom. And then after about two years, I stopped doing it. And, you know, so it's about three years, uh, about eight years, yeah. Um, and during that time, you know, I, uh, I made a lot of different changes. I was very bitter, very mad, very angry. Um, when I was about, uh, I, I ran home, I ran away from home, from my uncle's place for, for a bit, because he was pretty abusive and he was always just, he was like hardcore alcoholic, you know. So we didn't get on um, much at all. So it was really tough, so, you know, I, I left that place and I remember I lived on the streets for a little bit because I just, I, just I just couldn't be there anymore, you know. And uh, yeah, I was homeless for a little bit. I mean, I've got to a point where I was really hungry, so hungry that I started eating food out of the trash. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that stuff takes a toll on your mentality for a while. When you, when you just feel that you're absolutely less than the, you know, the dirt at the bottom of the trash. I had some kind of defining experiences, you know. I remember when I was 16 and I'd run away from um, our home and I, and, I, and I met some missionaries um, from, the, from the LDS church and it pretty much, they came at the right time, the time that I needed it the most. They came, they started teaching me the gospel and everything and basically I, you know, I became uh, uh, LDS at the age of 16 and then um, during that time, uh, when I, that, I was still living with my uncle then actually and uh, when he found out, he kicked me out of the house because I told him I, I couldn't buy him alcohol anymore. And I couldn't go and pick up the drugs packages for him anymore at different homes and stuff like that. And he was just like, well, what's your, what use do I have of you? Just get out of my house. Wow. So homeless again. And this time, you know, I, was, uh, you know I, I did that whole living on the streets for a little bit. I was too embarrassed to even tell people at church. You know what I mean? So I was, there was times I was going to school and I'd like sleep on the streets, <laughs> you know? And, and then uh, go to church on Sunday. And go to church on Sunday. So, okay, so you do that till your teenage years. You join the church at 16. Yeah. How do you end up in America? I got into music, you know, quite a bit for a little bit. And then um, after I was, a, I was a missionary, I did, I did missionary. I, was a, I served a mission in um, England, Bristol Mission. And that was when I was, uh, let me see, I was 23. Uh, uh, no, I was 21, yeah, 21 to 23. And had you been in the boy band? This was, this was after my mission. After, so you yeah. go to mission, you go on a yeah. mission, you go home to London? Yeah, came home to London. And I remember the last day, uh, my mission president, I mean, it pretty, the, the stuff that he said changed my life, pretty much. So, you know, the last day, you know, they, they give you an interview and say, you know, well done, return home with honor, you know, you do your thing. And, and I say, go home, you know, get an education, get married, you know, so, you know, that's what my mission president was telling me, you know, and hugged him, said goodbye. He changed my life. He was probably the only, the closest thing to a father figure I've ever had in my whole entire life. And I'm sure many missions will tell you that because a lot of missions, they came from broken homes and stuff like that. We, you know, so anyway, I remember him saying to me, hey, uh, other boy, one thing before you go. <laughs> and then he's like, I wonder if you would consider um, pursuing music as a profession. Yeah, I was like, what? He's like, that's what I feel I should tell you. <laughs> And had you, had you told him that you were into music? Had you, I had sang at like, his own conference yeah, or yeah. something? Yeah, and that was by accident. There was someone who was supposed to sing at a, a baptism or something like that, and didn't turn up. I think they were sick, probably threw up or something anyway. <laughs> Personal story in between. I, he's like, oh, news, he'll probably show it. Anyway, so cut to the clip. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, couldn't make it. Um, and so they said, Did anyone want to sing? I was like, yeah, sure, I'll get up. And I got up and I started singing, you know? And I think I just sang a hymn. And it was, you know, I wasn't really a member for long. So I had this experience where I, I sang and I felt like these tingles. And I was like, what the heck is that? It's like I felt it was so strong. And I remember just, I was remember thinking, like, I want to do that again. I want to do that again, you know. And I'm crying and people in the audience are crying, you know. And so I was like, wow. So my mission president just started getting me to sing all, in conferences all over, all over the mission. Wow. And that was just incredible. And that's where I kind of got a taste of the power of music. And on the last day, he says, you last should day. do it for a career. That's when he said that, yeah. And I was, I mean, I, that was not really in my radar. I, I mean, I was like, yeah, I love singing. It was fun. But when he said that, that changed everything. Because I was going home, I wanted to be a graphic designer or architect. <laughs> And so when I went home, that's what I started pursuing, music. How do you get into music? I had no idea. Yeah. So I joined the boy band. 
I started a boy band. How did, oh, you started? I you started grabbed some friends? I just grabbed some friends. We were all dancers, you know, um, and I got a couple of friends together. There was three of them, um, and uh, uh, it was crazy. And I remember, I remember, actually, the way it started, so one of my first gigs coming off my mission, I was a dancer for George Michael. Really? Yeah. I don't tell you about it, but yeah, I, yeah, I don't think you heard that one, but I was a dancer for George Michael. It was a very, very brief period, but I remember did, doing the audition, and uh, my whole, my whole I'd, I'd set up a boy band before this, so we were just kind of performing at church and stuff like that, you know? And then I got this gig, and then um, I had all the guys audition. We all auditioned together. I was the only one that made it. And that's, I felt really bad, you know? Because they were all just as good a dancer as I, as I, you know, as I was. So I made it, and they didn't. And then I remember when we, um, we turned up, one of our first gigs with George Michael was performing at the MTV European Music Awards. Oh, wow. And it was a live show going out to millions. And I remember we, we, had, we turned up two days before on the stage, you know, and we rehearsed you know, eight, nine hours a day. And then I remember during that time when we were rehearsing, we were just busting our gut and just tired and sweaty and everything. And George Michael comes, and he would perform, I think it was like for 12 minutes. Then he left. Now we still had another day to rehearse. And I'm like, oh guys, wait. I called up my guy. I was like, I'm in the wrong trade, man. <laughs> I was like, we're going to start singing. I'm gonna, let's start a boy band. Because the dude gets paid way more than the people in the band did. And works a lot less. <laughs> yeah, yeah, works a yeah. lot less. So I'm like, so I put this band together. And then one of the guys is like, who's there? He's like, Alex, that's great and everything, but there's one thing you're missing out. I'm like, what? He says, we can't sing. I was like, don't worry about that. Millie Vanilli, <laughs> Millie Vanilli didn't sing either. So anyway, no, no, literally, this is what I did. I went to the studio. So I won this um, uh, contest. It was like a radio station. And the winner got uh, uh, like a, a production deal with a studio. And this studio was this little, it was the size, smaller than this room. Wow. With a little eight track and a fax machine. <laughs> that was what I won. I could go in there anytime I want and record these made the dumbest songs. But it was experience. I probably recorded probably about two, three hundred songs. Do you still have them all? I, no, I don't know where they are. Oh, wow. You know, I don't know. Maybe my, my mom might have, I don't know. But anyway, so recorded all these songs and I'd practice, to practice, we'd go and perform at church to practice our songs, and the ones where the chicks cheered more, they were like, okay, that's, that's going on the album. <laughs> that's going on the album. Seriously, that's how we, we did it. So did the band take off? No, well, here's, so I went to the studio and I recorded all their voices and my voices. So I would, so when I'd get on, when we'd perform live, it's all my voice, all the backups and everything. It's all you. Yeah, so I'd give them three microphones and we turn theirs off. And mine was the only one that was on. <laughs> Bro, we killed it. We performed all these radio stations all across England. And then slowly, you know, you get radio stations, let's say like, like, here, like here you'd have um, like um, a celebrity that's traveling through and they'll come and do a radio thing, right? Yeah. So we did all that. So we started meeting up with all these celebrities. You know, I remember Jay-Z, right? This is in 1994, five, six, something like that. He'd come through. Before it, he was huge. Oh no, well, yeah. We opened for him. Oh my word. We didn't even know, I didn't even know this two years until Derek told me, like about two years ago. I was like, that you, you had opened for Jay-Z. Yeah, do you remember when we opened up for Jay-Z? I'm like, what? <laughs> and then Missy Elliott, I'm like. No way. Are you kidding? Yeah, in Germany, don't you remember that? I'm like. Wow, but you guys had gigs then. We had gigs, You were yeah. going all yeah, over the place. Yeah, we started all over the place because this radio station just hooked us up and, we, and it was like all over Germany, all over like Europe and Germany and everything. Were you making money? No, but we were making a heck of a life. It was awesome. You know, we're like <laughs> young kids, man, girls throwing themselves at you, man. It's like, ah, oh, they're freaking living. It was great. <laughs> we live on podiums. That's well, what we did. Well, I think a lot of people think once you're touring with oh, those artists, you're on. making bank. You have no idea. You have to pay. Yeah. What people don't realize is that if you open up for an artist that's big, you have to pay to get on. It's called pay to play. And then you don't you have to pay your band? You got to pay. You got to pay the transportation. You got to pay a band. You got to pay everyone. So we used to go and uh, go to the nightclubs, chat up with chicks, we'd chat up the girls, and and get money from them to pay for our gas. <laughs> It, I tell you, man, it was just a crazy life, bro. That that whole life was crazy, man. Okay, so how long did you do that? <laughs> did that for seven years. And you, you got tired of it and decided to go solo, or well, what? Well, it was it just it just got hard, man. It was like 
life on the road and you're you're trying to live a certain standard right and so you're like in between you got one foot in zion and one foot in babylon that's the way i always used to say and i go and i'm bouncing in between mm. and it was like it was just hard man it's like you make a decision you're either this or you're this if you try and be both it's just a nightmare so i just had to make a decision i remember one time um the thing that really set it off is that i just did a gig this was in uh it was called the Dome in Germany. I think it was in Berlin. It was like a just huge stadium, 90,000 people, something like that. We had all these bands that come on and off, you know, from NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, mm -hmm. and then all the boy bands. And we all went on the lineup as well. And I remember afterwards when we'd finished, I'm at the hotel, I get a knock on the door, and there was like, I can't remember what band it was, that said to me, hey, you know, there's a, there's a party next door, you wanna come? I was like, yeah, sure, I'll just go get a shower and everything. And, uh, this might be, I swear it was one of the Backstreet Boys, but I can't quote, I, I swear, anyway, because we knew them really well at yeah. the time, you know what I mean, because we're all touring together. Yeah. But anyway, they were there at the party. And I remember just going, so I get out of the shower, and, you know, and get dressed, and then I'm heading next to, next door, the hotel room next door. And always like, <laughs> right? And the, there's like no lights or anything, you know? Yeah. So I open up the door and I can hear this noise. <laughs> and I'm walking in and then the only light I saw was this glass, uh, it's like a glass table. And underneath there was a light that was like shining on the table and you could just see people lining up cocaine and just, oh, wow. just lines on the, oh, on, the, on the glass table. And I remember standing there <laughs> and it's like everything slowed down, you know? And, I, I'm, and this is the craziest thing. The thing that came to my mind, it was like I got this crazy epiphany, and I swear it was, it was so powerful. I was, I was taken back to my mission president when he said, Elder Boye, I hope that you will consider choosing music as a profession. Mm -hmm. And here I am doing that. But there was another thing I didn't tell you. And he said, and I hope that we would use it to help build the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. I'm standing right there, glass table, everyone half naked, Doing people that. snorting cocaine, and I remember just like, something tells me that this is not what my mission president meant. No, no. I ran out of there so fast. It was like, I felt like I was asleep, and I just woke up. Mm -hmm. It was the crazy, it's like that story, the lukewarm frog, you put it in the water, you know? It's so the thing about us is that, so a lot of times, when it comes to religious people, I have this thing, sometimes we think we're a lot stronger than we are. We think that once we carry this label of religious or whatever that means, we think we're invincible. And so, you know, a lot of times I remember, you know, being, you know, I was like, oh, I'm a returned missionary. Oh, I don't get up to that kind of stuff. That. Next minute I'm right there and I'm just like, what the heck happened? You know, it's very slow, very slow process. You have to be on your guard every day. The Backstreet Boys are back doing their tour. Mm -hmm. Would you get back with that boy band and reunite? Um, we've been, I've been have offered to, not with Backstreet Boys, but we've been offered to put the band back together again because they're all these like throwback TV shows. Right? That's yeah. like the in thing. Yeah, you know, and I actually did go back and I did one. We did a TV show. It was actually for a documentary. And we had the band back together again. Oh, oh it was hilarious. We we're doing the same moves and we were so tired. <laughs> We were like, <laughs> 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 like put all the muscle. <laughs> oh my gosh, right? So Stop pumping veins, yeah. You have that really powerful moment there at the party. Yeah. Is that when you decide you're going to kind of change your focus and is that what brought you to the States? Yeah. I was kind of like in despair and just wondering where I was going in my life. When I'd left the record, I'd left the band then and my manager was ticked and the guys in the band was ticked and because to them I was taking away their future, you know? And we all lived in really bad areas, you know what I mean? Literally like the hood and different parts of London, Tottenham. And, and so anyway, that was really tough. Um, but I, uh, I knew that I had to do something different. And I remember just praying and just like wondering where I was going with my life and everything. And I didn't get any answers, but just stuff just started happening, you know? Um, like one experience was when I was walking, I was, I was at church and I see this, uh, poster on the floor. It's just like a little, and it said, uh, Mormon Arts Festival in, in Provo, Utah. And I saw it on the floor and I was like, for musicians, you know? I was like, dude, that sounds interesting. So I just got on a plane. I just, I just turned up. Mm. And uh, I turned up in Utah. And first of all, 
I just remember just like when I got off the plane, I was like, okay, this is where I need to be. Wow. And I was like, I gotta figure out how to how to get here. This is it was totally different. It was like a total break from everything. I, I realized I needed to get away from all the people that I used to spend time with. I needed to change my like my whole everything. network, everything, you know? And it was hard on my mom at the time, you know, and I just said, Mom, I just I just gotta do this. And so, you know, I I came to Utah and I started doing LDS music and stuff and then Seven years later, I ended up as a Tabernacle Choir member, which was just mind-blowing. It pretty much just changed everything about me, you know? And, um, you know, the other thing that a lot of people don't know is that when I first came out to Utah, I, I came with a lot of baggage, with a lot of struggles. One of them was I had a major pornography problem, major. And I remember the first few weeks when I came to Utah, I, went, I was living in Orem, and I went to the institute there, and that was literally my therapy. I would sit outside the institute building when it opened, and I'd get in there and I would stay in the cha in that chapel. I'd stay in the institute building all day. You know, I'd go home, and as soon as I left the building, I'd get all those thoughts again. And then I had to run back to the church, and I was there. I would there sometimes when I would just like talk to the janitor, and I'd say, "Can I just sleep here on the church bench? Can I just sleep here in the chapel?" Wow. You know, sometimes they'd let me, and I, I was in just. They say that it's harder to get off, it's easier to get off cocaine than it is um, pornography. I've never had cocaine, but let me tell you something. That's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, get off that. And that was all through my boy band and, you know. Since you got home from your mission? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and how did you get off it? You know when they talk about cold turkey? <laughs> I mean, you were there it at the That's what I had to. I remember I once read this scripture once where it talked about how, I wish I could remember where it was, but it talks a lot about how, you know, when, it's, when someone, when, when Jesus healed the sick or he had cast like, you know, devils out of people, um, one of the things that it said is that you had to, so now you've got an empty house. And what happens is, and afterwards, it says all those devils came back again afterwards. Because what it is is that you, now that you've got an empty house, you've got to fill it. You have to fill it with. Something totally different with good. If you just, if it's just empty, then there's still space for them to come. But I had to literally fill it with good. So I, I took that literally. I'm talking about, you know, I would come, I'd go to church, I'd go to that, the institute every single day, every class. They all knew me there, man. Jack Christensen changed my life. His, his talks, man, I, I, it was like, it was like water, like water to me, a thirsty soul. And every single day, and then when I'd leave, I'd have to take scripture and read it. That's the only time I never got those urges. So of course, what did I do? I am filling my mind like over and over. And then eventually it just started to- Phase out. Yeah, it's a very slow process and it just started to fade out. And all I did was just, you know, in, just engorge my mind was with anything that was spiritual. And, I, and it was, it, it changed my life. And it, I've got to tell you though, it's like, the thing is, it's like as a smoker, if you're a smoker, when, when, I remember when I was on mission, I used to teach the non-smoking program, right? To people before they got baptized, right? And I remember one of the things that we, we'd always say is that now we'd say like, just because you stop smoking, it doesn't, still doesn't mean you're a non-smoker. By the way, you will always be a smoker. You always will. Because all you have to do is walk past the pub, sit in a bar, nightclub, or sit on a, a train, and someone's smoking right next to you, and all of a sudden, comes back. So it's like you have to go further off the edge than everyone else. Some people can smell secondhand smoke, and they're like, "Uh, what's that? Yeah. Smokers will send that smoke, even if you haven't smoked for years. So now, I had to look at myself, and I'm like, TV shows? I can't watch the stuff that most people watch. I can't watch a HBO movie. Just a simple HBO movie that just have sex scenes. Or even ones that don't, you know what I mean? That kind of stuff. I can't watch them. And it's probably gonna be like that forever. So it's, it's like, you know, yeah, I, you know, I'm not in pornography. I don't, I don't look at it and stuff like that. But even just the small amount that most people are just like, oh, yeah, simple kissing scene and stuff like that. There's things you can't watch because you have to stay away, further away from the edge than everyone else. When did you get to the point though where you could acknowledge that and then discuss it and say, listen, I, I had this issue and I gotta 
I was, you're talking 15 years. Wow. You know? And, because uh, that's the other thing, you know, one of the big things, especially when we talk about, one of the biggest things now is just mental illness and. Which your new song yeah. about suicide, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's a really big thing because it's, it's the, th we, we need to talk about it more, you know? And sometimes we, we don't because we think that either people will think of us less or we're warriors. You know, sometimes we walk around like we're invincible, you know? And, uh, or like, you know, sometimes the strong people, the, the seemingly strong people, everyone thinks, oh yeah, they're fine. Nobody wants to check on them. Nobody wants to ask how they're doing and stuff like that. So they don't tell you, you know, that I was probably that, that person, you know? I was the one that would kind of help other people, but like nobody wanted to really know what was going on with me. Because I never really told them. Because everyone think everything's great. And we do that a lot. You know, we walk around. I believe that we're all crying inside. There's every single one of us. We have something going on inside us. We're not perfect. We have issues and situations, family, whatever, this and that, financially, whatever. And sometimes it causes things, you know, and, and, and it gets stirred up inside us. And, you know, it manifests itself in, you know, depression and anxiety and, you know what I mean, suicidal thoughts and stuff like that. And because we don't want to talk, but I think the most important thing is that we, we, we talk about these things, we have real conversations, and we say, look, I'm going through this too, you know? And, and even if I'm not going through it, I know somebody who is, and really, in my family, you know? It's like, it's that close. So that's been a really uh, big thing for me lately, that, that I, want to, I want to simply, you know, tell people, look, it's okay not to be okay. It's not, it's not, you know, don't act like everything is good. Don't act like you've got it all prepared and you've got it all planned. You know, we look at people's Instagram posts and we just think, oh yeah, man, that's just like you, you are, I hate you. You're going on a vacation again, you know, with your whole family, you're at Disneyland and I'm sitting here at home in the dark with a sucky life, right? It's so easy to just compare like our best, like someone's best online to our worst in reality. Yeah. Wherein you don't, what you don't understand is that family in Disney is going through major struggles that you probably wouldn't want to go through. So it's like, you know, we compare ourselves, everyone, you know? Comparison is the thief of joy. When we compare, it steals our own joy. And, you know, so that's really been a, a big push for me, particularly with my music, to, to just bring more awareness to, um, to the issues that we face every single day. I woke up in a bad mood this morning. You know, and people like look and think, oh yeah, look at Alex, oh, you know, he's got this and that. Why are we in a bad mood? I don't know. Just didn't get enough sleep? See, that's what I'm saying. It's like, sometimes when, you, when you've got a lot of things, a lot of stress, a lot of things going on, Sometimes it manifests itself in different ways to different people. Some people don't have a problem with it. But other people, they do. Some people have to work at it. Like, you know, there's some people who are just skinny all the time. They can eat whatever they freaking want. Yeah. And, right? And you hate them, right? <laughs> but there are other people that are skinny, but they have to work for it. You know what I mean? So they have to do everything on a daily basis. That's me. I'm, I'm, I'm that person. You know? Performing has got to boost your spirits though yeah it's amazing out. yeah so you've done so many cool songs covers of songs yeah. we were talking before about believer yeah for, uh, i mean songs that you would know but you have your original songs yeah. lemonade yeah. what what is your favorite song to perform i think i don't know it's always it's just like asking what your favorite kid is you know yeah the one that's behaving i don't know <laughs> yeah right so yeah it's just uh, every song is like a, it has a purpose and for me and so i don't see myself as having a favorite yet if you could know. perform with anyone, who would you perform with? Oh gosh, man. That's interesting, interesting question. Um, I'd love to perform with Nas X and sing Country Road, Old Town Road with, no, I'm just kidding. You might hit number one on <laughs> iTunes if you do that for well, weeks and weeks. I'm gonna take my yeah. horse to the Old Town Road, I'm gonna <laughs> ride. No, just kidding. Isn't that crazy? That song's but just taken off. Yeah, and that's it's huge. What's, isn't it crazy? It's awesome. Like, that, that could that be your story, next song. That whole story is like insane how that happened. Yeah. You know? But um, yeah, so I'm looking for my Old Town Road. And I think it's coming. And who's it going to be with, though? I don't know. I don't know. Taylor I don't really, Swift? I don't really have a favorite. I would not say no to Taylor Swift. You have to be done. Bruno Mars is another one. Yeah. I like, would not say no, you know? Yeah. As there's, there are. There are quite a few artists, you know? Um, right. Okay. I'm just going to say it. Say it. So, my manager's been talking to Lauren Daigle's manager. Wow. And we're getting close. Dude. To a duet. 
So, breaking news. It's the first time I've said it. Breaking news. We, uh, I've, I've got a gig December the 5th that, um, at Carnegie Hall. And we just, uh, we just landed Lauren Daigle, who's going to be on that bill with me, and a whole bunch of artists, but we're going to do a duet uh, together. So, Carnegie Hall. I'm excited in about December. that. Yeah, so we're looking to, you know, working on, we're, we're just looking at songs right now to see what's like a perfect fit for both of oh, us. Oh man, that'd be and awesome. And we're gonna go record it, do a music video, everything. So. You know Garth Brooks is coming here in July. Oh really? And they, they just announced yesterday, a few days ago, that Luke, not Luke Bryan, Luke uh, Blake Bryan? Shelton. Blake Shelton, oh, right. They're premiering a duet at that Boise oh, concert. Oh, that's gonna be huge. Yeah. That's gonna be huge. You should join them. Man, yeah, yeah man, you never Special know. guest, Alex Boyle. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, if you could be uh, one year from now, uh, June of 2020, where are you? I'm doing the same thing I'm doing right now, but on steroids. Yeah. That's it. It's, it's like, I've not, I don't have an agenda. It's like, you know, oh, if I was, you know, but what would I be doing if I had this money or this and that? The exact same thing I'm doing now. Okay, but, but it also in your dreams, what is that? Are you? It's really, it's really just, the, the, my, the mission statement for my music is three, three letters, joy. And everything else around that, whatever it is, it's like, does that bring me joy? Does it bring my fans joy? People that don't know me, does it bring them joy? If it doesn't, you know, I'm not a part of that. So for me, I want to do bigger shows, bigger tours, working with bigger acts, doing duets and collaborations with bigger acts. I want to use music to build. Um, there's so many things that destroy on this planet, so many things that destroy whether it's people, whether it's certain types of media, certain types of social me you know, media and stuff like that, that just destroys. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I want to join a band of, of, uh, of artists who are out there who are wanting to do the opposite and, and, and build. All right, you gotta go check out Alex Boyer, YouTube, his YouTube channel. I know you said you're not a YouTuber, but that's where oh, you, still can, there. I'm you still can get a flavor yeah, yeah. for his music. Before we go, do you, do you want to sing something? So this is a, a song, if you get a chance, go check it out. It's a new song called uh, Still Breathing. And I did a music video that's all Games of Thrones themed. It's crazy. So go check it out. It's called Still Breathing. Um, but this song focuses on um, uh, mental illness and, and the fact that, look, we can, if we're still breathing, then it's never too late to be who we want to be, the things that we want to accomplish. As long as we're still here and we're still breathing, it's never too late. And so that's kind of what it's about. Stressed out like a rubber band, stressed out like a working man, oh, all I need is a helping hand from someone who loves me, best friends with anxiety, no one even checks on me, no, little love is medicine from someone who cares, I thought that I always missing something but I found it the moment I get held a little silence that surrounds me now I'm still breathing still breathe still breathe still breathe still breathe still breathe breathe yeah beautiful <laughs> All right, Alex, yeah, you can get the rest of the song on yeah, your yeah. website. Yeah. It's available. Thanks for coming in, man. Thank you, bro. Good chatting with Appreciate you. Appreciate it. It's always good. Thank you for Hanging watching. Out with you. Have a happy week.